Hey everyone, it's the host of All Across America, Marco Vig. Thank you for being a listener. The show is free, of course. All I ask of you is that you share it with friends and give us a review on Spotify or Apple. And it would be great to hear from you. We're on Instagram at All Across America or visit our new website, allacrossamerica.com. I try to respond personally to everybody who reaches out, so say hello. All right, on with the show. Podcasting from Portland East to Portland West, Big Pine Key to Pacific Beach, and from San Juan to Guam, this is All Across America. Let's do it. Uh, we're here at the Good Life Center in Harborside, Maine, the site of the second homestead of Helena Scott Nearing, who were very influential in the Back to Land movement. Uh, Warren Berkowitz is a board member of the Good Life Center and a longtime friend of the Nearings. Um, Warren, it's an honor to be here, and it's, a, it's an honor to have you on the show. Yeah, it's great to be here. Thank you very much. So maybe we could start with uh, just describe how you met the Nearings. Yep. Uh, back in the mid-70s, I came up to Maine after reading their book, Living the Good Life, and reading a lot of uh, Helen's um, articles in Mother Earth News, um, I said, boy, I really need to meet these people. Uh, They sounded really interesting. And I came up, and they were in the middle of uh, building their new home out of stone uh, next to the original homestead in Maine. And um, I found them very interesting. And... um, and then I decided uh, after meeting with them that I would move up to Blue Hill area, and I found an old farmstead that was dilapidated and uh, bought that that next winter. And then shortly after that, I met a young woman who also did a pilgrimage uh, up to meet them nearings, and we ended up getting married. And she, my wife Nancy, was really close friends with the nearings, and that's how I got to know them really oh, well. Oh, okay. Yeah, and she, uh, she assisted uh, Scott in his last year of life uh, in a hospice way and okay. also worked with Scott for many years. And then after Scott died, uh, Nancy and Helen uh, were, were great friends until uh, Helen died in 1995. Okay. So uh, she was a big part of our family. We had two kids who used to come out and, you know, play around the garden while we work with Helen in the garden, and right. they really uh, thought of her as their grandmother okay. in a lot of ways. So wow. it was really a wonderful relationship. Wow. Okay. And and describe the pilgrimages. You're, you're, you're one of... Many, many, many people that made pilgrimages. Exactly, yeah. Here. Back in the 60s and 70s, uh, what they call the countercultural movement, there were a lot of people looking for alternative ways of living. Right. Uh, you know, the civil rights movement, the anti-war, the Vietnam War happened, the women's movement. I mean, there was all kinds of uh, efforts that people were looking for alternative ways to live. Yeah. And uh, one certainly was the Back to the Land movement. Yeah. And Helen and Scott, in their book, Living the Good Life, which came out in the early 50s, uh, their book (laughs) exploded in the 60s and 70s. It got interpreted uh, in many languages all around the world, and uh, thousands and thousands of people would come up uh, to visit them who read the book, and they were huge influences on what we call kind of the Back to the Land uh, people, hippies call them whatever you want but uh, we were just searching for new ways to live and uh, the description of their life in living the good life was very very attractive it combined uh, uh, kind of looking at the natural world in a very interesting way and a very productive way since at at that time there was a lot of work uh, because of pesticides and chemical fertilizers people were really concerned about the food supply Um, They also talked about their philosophy of living, uh, why they did things. They talked about their daily life and how they did it, Mm -hmm. which was very interesting. And they also uh, talked about their politics and, uh, you know, why they were doing what they were doing. And uh, all those combined to be a really attractive package to young people seeking alternatives. And like I said, thousands of people uh, at that time... Uh, were really looking for alternatives, and they were really the icons of the Back to the Land right. movement and icons of the organic gardening movement in right. this country. Before it was a thing, before there were whole foods. I mean, it's exactly. funny that they actually used the term whole foods in exactly. the book, which is, yeah, yeah. was probably co-opted for you know what we now know as the whole food store. Exactly. Yeah. They, they weren't the only ones doing the Back to the Land movement. Certainly after World War II and the atomic age, a lot of people kind of looked 
uh, in a survivalist way to go back to the land. Uh, but they, they were encouraged to write about their experience, and, um, and as a result, uh, they were very good writers, uh, and uh, they wrote books about sun-heating greenhouses, uh, just about gardening and how to do four-season gardening. They were the first ones, really, to put that down on paper. Right. And also their philosophy about looking into, looking at the natural world and then living your life uh, in that way. Right. And that's why they came up with the composting ideas that they did that were so effective. Yeah. And Helen was a lifelong vegetarian, and then Scott became a vegetarian after he met Helen. And that was also very attractive uh, to young people at the time who yeah. were looking for ways to uh, have good, fresh food that w- and live in a very healthy manner. Uh, uh, I think the book Diet for a Small Planet came out, yes. Francis LePay, and that yes. had a big influence. So that combined with the Nearings books just uh, made them very, very popular. Right. Right. And um, this, we're in Harborside, Maine. This is the site of their second, um, I guess, experiment. Their first was in in Vermont, which they moved there, I guess, during the height of the Great Depression. Exactly. Yeah. They were both, they were living together at the time uh, in New York City. Uh, He had been blacklisted from teaching. So he was still writing for progressive magazines and newspapers, but they really had trouble making a living. Right. And so they, along with many others, uh, looked to go back to the land, and they bought a large tract of land in Vermont, in a valley in Vermont, that a lot of actually urban people ended up moving there. Mm-hmm. They had a, quite a community of people there. Right. Uh, but towards uh, the end of World War II, they could see the community changing. The ski industry moved into their right. valley, and they had this beautiful stone house that they had built with a beautiful window, just like we are right. today. Uh, looking out on the ocean, they were looking out on Stratton Mountain, and they could see the ski trails being made. Uh, okay. And so they decided that it was time to leave, even though they had a beautiful, uh, beautiful place there. And uh, they had a maple sugar business, and they had hundreds of acres of uh, sugar bush that they donated to the town at the time, and it's still undeveloped, and because wow. that was the caveat that they, uh, when they gave it to the town. And it's one of the large tract of land, apparently, in that part of Vermont. Wow. That's undeveloped. Right, and particularly southern Vermont, where the ski mountain, they were outside of Jamaica, Exactly, outside of Jamaica. uh, Yeah, that's uh, very well developed, and a lot of of money coming from uh, points further south. Exactly. And, and, I mean, I read that they bought the property for uh, in total for a few thousand and it was estimated to be worth six million dollars and i did the math it, it, it accrued in value three thousand times in 20 years hmm. because of the the ski mountain okay. was there and so they decided that instead of taking these millions of dollar payday to to donate it to the the town of of, of stratton which is just amazing Exactly. Yeah, I wasn't sure of the economics of it, but yeah, they did donate it, and it's wow. still there. Yeah. And um, so, why Maine? I mean, it's, I, I guess it makes sense because it is so different. You know, here you are in the green mountains of Vermont, where right. you know it's not known for any water, even even lakes, really, in Vermont. And here we are overlooking uh, the the salt water, exactly. overlooking the bay. Well, I think they were looking for a very rural area to to uh, end up in, and that's where they did. I mean, there were stories about. You know, that uh, she kind of uh, looked on a map and just figured, you know, just took a guess that this would be. But they looked around, and at the time, in the early 50s, uh, this part of Maine was very undeveloped. Yeah. Uh, Since then, there's been a lot of summer homes built along the shore and things like that. But the town of Brooksville is still very quiet. And in the 1950s, it was really quiet. So it really fit the bill. And they found this, you know, beautiful old dilapidated house um, and uh, decided that this would be where they would put down roots and it was enough land that they thought that they could uh, kind of develop a small community of like-minded people, okay. which they did. They sold uh, acres of most of their land actually to like-minded people okay. uh, over in the 60s and 70s. And yeah. are uh, many of those folks still here today? Or uh, there's descended? a few people still there and uh, a mile down the road is Four Season Farm, Elliot Coleman's farm, okay. and he's well known in the uh, commercial organic gardening, okay. farming rather. Yeah, and he learned his skills, his early skills from Scott. Okay, and um, he came and went over the years, but uh, he's established himself as a, a real icon of the commercial 
uh, farming. Wow. Okay. I mean, so farming. we're talking influence beyond the generations. Oh, without yeah, a, without a doubt. That's yeah. that's amazing. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Um, and, and, you know, we're, we're here. It's again, saltwater air, but just, just to paint the picture for people, this is still a, a rural community. We're 20 minutes to the nearest corner store, you know, a, a more than a half hour to a supermarket. It's still largely undeveloped coastal land. You know, it's down East Maine. So it's, mm-hmm. you know, it's many hours North of even, you know, the, the Southern Maine, which is much more developed and built up. And, um, uh, I, I think a lot of people hear coastal communities and they, you know, fig, figure big money and, you know, lots of houses, but uh, we're on a dirt road and uh, it's, it still remains that to this day. Um, maybe you could talk about the, their gardening and their, their, their farming sure. y- y- uh, philosophy. Sure. And I think uh, one interesting aspect to them is that they, along with others like the Rodales in uh, Pennsylvania and other people, right. They came along uh, kind of espousing their organic gardening ideas at the time when chemical fertilizers and pesticides were really reaching their uh, popularity right. in terms of farming. And also corporate farming came in at that time. And uh, so, you know, you're looking at people who are really swimming against the tide yeah. in a way, uh, but they were very firm in their belief that the best way to grow food, the best way to eat food was to do it organically. Mm. And what they did is they looked to the natural world. How did, how does the forest, uh, you know, fertilize and uh, themselves, you know, the trees in the forest. And basically, you know, it's by, uh, all this organic matter, uh, decomposing on the forest floor, uh, with all the microorganisms and uh, all the aspects of that happening. And that's what they thought. They thought that that's how they would feed their, uh, their garden. The, is the, the circle compost. of life of the forest. Exactly. And uh, their philosophy was put every piece of organic material they could find, and they weren't meat eaters, they were uh, vegetarians, uh, into the garden. So that meant kitchen scraps, uh, any weeds and things like that. Um, that they, you know, uh, in in terms of working the garden, went into the compost. Uh, here on the coast, uh, they would go to the uh, to the cove right out here and get seaweed and put the seaweed in the garden. Oh wow! And uh, into the compost, and they found that that added not only important minerals, but it also broke down really quickly. And um, so they would uh, they would just um, use that compost. And Scott's. And Helen's philosophy was that the fertile, you know, the garden would be as fertile at the end of the season as it was in the beginning. So even though the the plants used all these nutrients while they were growing and giving them vegetables, they would constantly feed the soil. So uh, first of all, when they planted, they would always top dress or dig in compost. And then as the season went, they would continue to top dress with compost. So that at the end of the season, their garden was just as fertile as it was at the beginning wow. of the season. And they just had this constant cycle of making compost, putting compost in the garden and the greenhouse. And as a result, they grew, you know, amazing vegetables. Yeah. Um, the, the garden at the old house, the first homestead in Maine, uh, was a hundred by hundred uh, stone wall garden. And... Uh, it literally changed my life when I walked into that garden. I've yeah. never seen anybody grow so much food in a small area uh, so successfully. Yeah, 1,000 square feet. Yeah, it was amazing. And uh, and that fact that two elders were able to do this right. all by themselves. I mean, they had some volunteer help, but sure. it was basically them. It was very, very impressive. And Scott's uh, compost heaps, he would have like 10 compost heaps going at the same wow. time. And like I said, he put almost anything uh, organic into them and would let them, um, you know, he wouldn't use them right away. He would let them really decompose yeah. over time and then use them in the garden. Uh, when you garden with Scott and asked him any question about anything to do with gardening, uh, it always began with three words and always ended with three words. And that was improve your soil. <laughs> That's what he said. No matter whether you're talking about cucumbers, tomatoes, Makes sense. squash, <laughs> and he always said, improve your soil. Yeah. Then he would tell you his ideas. 
and then it would end with improve your soil. Yeah, smart man. Repeat the message. <laughs> exactly. He, he, that was his mantra, and he stuck with it. Yeah, yeah. And clearly it worked. It worked very well. And, and how do they do it? I mean, we're in Maine. It's, uh, the growing season is short. Exactly. Yeah, they were very good gardeners. They did have a sun-heated greenhouse. Okay. And um, they would start things early and keep things going in the greenhouse. And then uh, after a while, they experimented with four-season growing where they would plant some uh, hardy uh, crops like uh, spinach and Asian greens and uh, other things like kale in the greenhouse itself, cover it with hay. This was before... There was a lot of technological advancement in greenhouse growing, okay. with like row cover and heating and things like this. Right. Uh, they would cover it, and then they would, um, most of them would die because it was so cold. But then come February when the, the sun heated up and March, uh, a certain percentage of those greens would survive. So they had early greens in February and March wow. from the greenhouse. And then he would go into the greenhouse and start his seedlings. And, uh, and that's how they extended the season on both ends okay. really successfully. But it, it's a harsh environment for sure. Yeah. And uh, it's gotten warmer, obviously, with climate change over the last few decades. But uh, they were able to probably, uh, we estimate about 80% of their diet came from their garden. Wow. And then they would buy... Uh, big vats of peanut butter. They would buy grains because uh, they didn't have enough land to really grow their own grains, right. nor did they want to spend the time doing that. Um, so they did augment their uh, diet with other things, uh, but a large part of their diet came from the garden. Wow. And they would grow things that would last through the winter, um, you know, potatoes, squash, cabbages sure. that they would store down in the basement right. that they would eat during the winter. And the, the root cellar. Yes. Can, exactly. you, can you talk about that? Well, it was pretty funky. It was nothing fancy. Yeah. I mean, in this in the stone house, it was basically just the basement. Uh, in the right. other house, they did have a little uh, section uh, just for their uh, vegetables that they stored. Um, but um, yeah, there was nothing fancy. They just put, put carrots and other root vegetables away for the winter and use them in stews and soups and uh, mix them with grains so that it came, became a pretty healthy diet. They, yeah. they spent a lot of time studying health and studying diet, and um, uh, it really paid off. They were very, very healthy. Yeah, I mean, it clearly, <laughs> Scott was 100 and exactly. Helen was 91, so they were obviously doing something right. Exactly. They worked really hard. Their philosophy was to work every day. Uh, physical labor every day yeah. for several hours. Then they dedicated several hours to what they called uh, being a community member, which meant answering letters, inviting people into their home. Yeah. And then they also dedicated every day to their intellectual pursuits. They were amazing readers and uh, amazing writers. So um, right. They, that's how kind of they split up their day. And they were very, uh, very disciplined about that. Yeah, I mean, they're very almost meticulous in what they did. Exactly. I mean, oiling their tools. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's like, oh, I got to do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it was a hard act to follow for sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, and they were very, very disciplined in their approach. And his record keeping, which uh, a lot of his garden records are down at archived down in Boston University okay. at the time, at this time. But, uh, yeah, they were very meticulous and very disciplined. They set five, ten-year plans and mm. stuck to them. I mean, extremely disciplined and to the point that they almost had a monastic lifestyle, particularly in terms of what they ate. And uh, Oh, I, without a doubt. That was their choice. Yeah. I mean, they, they, uh, they're they very interesting people in that they, uh, they both came from very wealthy families. Right. And they really turned their back on their inheritance yeah. and... Uh, set up a very ascetic life. I mean, if you look around this house, which is absolutely beautiful, nothing is comfortable. <laughs> I mean, because they didn't like to sit very long. <laughs> right. And, uh, and their beds and, uh, you know, and it's uh, the heating system. I mean, nothing is easy and nothing is comfortable. Right. And that's right. by design. I mean, and not only they were vegetarians, but they didn't do spices, garlic. As an and, Italian American, I'm like, no garlic? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. No alcohol, no, nope. uh, I mean, no drugs. They, tea, coffee? was uh, No, no tea, no caffeine or no wow. coffee at all. Wow. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, at least they were self-aware. I think they called bordering on deliberate self-punishment. <laughs> <laughs> it felt like that when you were w- with them, I'll tell you. It was not easy. Yeah, and they had no TV, no radio. They relied their news on uh, periodicals and uh, magazines, and that's how they, uh, they kept track of the world. And they almost had a vegan lifestyle. For uh, Was there any eggs in their diet or uh, milk no, products? Uh, the only reason they wouldn't have been vegans is they did use some honey. Uh, they bought honey, um, which they use in tea and things like that. Um, and then towards later in life, uh, Helen liked ice cream, so she would have ice cream now and then. Yeah. And uh, they included a little, as they got older, cottage cheese and yogurt. Uh, but very little, actually. Yeah. But they did. Yeah. So uh, they didn't... They considered themselves vegetarians, and uh, they did that uh, for health reasons and also um, for philosophical reasons against, uh, you know, the killing and slaughter of animals. Right. And uh, they felt that we really needed to uh, live in harmony with not only each other, but also with the natural world, and that was part of that philosophy. Right, right. Yeah. And uh, have some of their, you know, accolades, people that have come to the farm and stayed with them, taken a, a much different approach? Uh, you know, I imagine people homesteading may want to have chickens or pigs. Oh, or... sure. Yeah, yeah. I think they were very secure in that uh, their book, Living the Good Life, which is about Vermont. Then they wrote Continuing the Good Life, which was about Maine. Uh, they never intended it to be a prescription for the good life. They wanted it, and it was a description of their good life. Right. Okay. And they were very secure about saying, you need to find your good life, and it will not look like ours, okay. but there are certain elements that uh, you need to, to find in a good life. And so a lot of people who tried to follow their motto ended up being fairly frustrated uh, because it's not easy. No. And uh, they didn't have children, uh, and um, they didn't have animals. Uh, but uh, those people like myself and my wife and, and many, many, many others who saw it as a description really took elements of their philosophy and applied it to our lives. And yeah. uh, it was really uh, an amazing experience. I mean, they, they influenced, like I said, people from all over the world. Right. And we still get visitors from all over the world who have read their books or their parents read their books or their grandparents read right, the books. Right. And they come here and leave very, very inspired uh, by their words and their yeah. deeds. Yeah, they did. They did a lot of good. Um, but do you think it was, and you mentioned they both came from very wealthy backgrounds. Do you think it was a, a reaction to the way that they were brought up and the, the, they decided that they did come from, you know, a considerable means, but they wanted to turn their backs to that and... Well, I think as a young woman, Helen had the opportunity to travel around the world, and she ended up having uh, a relationship with a, a kind of an Indian guru named Krishnamurti, who uh, he really espoused a very, uh, you know, a philosophy of loving and caring about the world and about people, and I think that had a big influence, or influence on her as well as her travels around the world. Yeah. Um, and, uh, I think Scott, as a young person, uh, lived a very, um, very privileged life. Uh, his family owned, uh, basically owned a whole town, a coal mining town, and he was privately tutored and got the best of everything where the other kids in his town, uh, worked in the coal mine and died in the coal mine and got maimed in the coal wow. mine. So that made an indelible, uh, impression on him as a young person. And so when he got into uh, a position uh, where he could help people, he did. When he got his uh, degree at the University of Pennsylvania, he advocated for child labor laws, uh, which got him into a lot of trouble with their board of trustees, and he eventually got fired. Uh, So he was very much for the underdog uh, and it, I think it was based on his childhood. And sure. he, he talks about it, that book in, uh, in his book, uh, Making of a Radical, about uh, how he became uh, kind of politicized right. as a young person. So I think the combination of, you know, Helen's world travels and things like that. And uh, she also came from a very progressive family. Uh, they were vegetarians. They were theosophists. Okay. So she already had an inclination of... Um, 
what it was to kind of live outside the norm. Sure. And then uh, I think Scott's strong political views, uh, he was a communist at one point, and then he was very much into the socialist movement. Okay. And uh, all, always believing in, in democracy and the importance of democracy. But he really spoke out against, you know, economic injustice, income inequality, uh, war profiteering, things like that, and sure. continuously got into trouble with the establishment. Right, and he, and he a was a he was a PhD economist. And yes, he taught was, at yes. Wharton and was oh, yeah. was was forcibly removed from their staff. Exactly, he had written you know tens and tens of books about political science and economics. That when he was blacklisted. Uh, Got removed from college libraries all over the, all over the country, wow. and his case, very interesting, ended up being one of the cases that led to, uh, you know, the per, um, the professionals at uh, universities becoming tenured. His case was one of really? several that okay. were instrumental in getting that wow. happening because of his dismissal. Because I remember reading, and I was sort of, I'm thinking to myself, I guess he wasn't tenured, but it sounds like tenure did not exist no, at that time. No, it only happened after that, and his wow. case was a big part of that. Wow. All right. So, I mean, he's also really a freedom of speech and academia oh, icon. Oh, absolutely. Oh, wow. yes. Yeah, yeah. And my understanding is that Wharton actually made a public apology and gave yes. him an honorary degree. When he was in his 90s, <laughs> right, University of Pennsylvania, <laughs> uh, apologized and he got, uh, yeah, he got a certificate. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And w- one of the strongest themes, in, at least in living the good life, is the, the community and trying to find that sense of community. And it seemed like in Vermont, they tried very, very hard to have right. a bartering economy, to have you know, community centers and community voices. And they struggled. They they had one thing that they felt did really well in reading the book was um, there was they were in a rural postal route and the mm-hmm. the postmaster was going to close the or stop delivery to them and right. they were able to and this was during World War Two so you had all these young men who were abroad and wanted to you know write home to sure. their, their folks and that was the one thing they were able to really rally the community around. It got to the New York Times and. Hmm. Um, eventually it was um, uh, um, reversed. Did, did they find that sense of community here in, in Harborside? Well, I think in Harborside they were a bit frustrated about um, developing that community. I mean, they had a lot of people living on the land that they had sold. Uh, but again, you know, their philosophy was a description. So if people didn't follow, like, became meat eaters and things like that sure. that would frustrate them but right. uh it was just kind of everybody uh you know once they owned their own land did their own thing uh so they were somewhat frustrated i think with the harborside community but the main community i think they really embraced they became uh central in um in the development of mafka the main organic farmers and gardens association okay. which is one of the leading uh, organizations in the country in terms wow. of uh, uh, organic, you know, uh, advocating for an uh, organic gardening and farming. And they were central in, in getting that set up. Um, and I think they felt really good about being part of that main. And also, they spent a lot of time uh, traveling around the world. They were invited to speak uh, all over the world. Uh, post-World War II, they spent time in the, uh, you know, in the Eastern Bloc countries, Okay. Uh, and um, so they, I think they were frustrated with the immediate um, community, but uh, I think they, they understood that people are just, you know, have to do their own thing. Right, yeah. right. And so, I mean, the community around here, just for folks, there's a lot of lobstering, and, you know, there are lobster oh, yeah. men that live right, right down the street. And, yeah. <laughs> so. A lot of independent living, and yes. I think they were respected independently. Right. But even to this day, uh, people will comment on their communist thoughts and things like that sure. you know, the local people right uh, but i think they they were such hard workers that i think people ended up just like they do in maine kind of respecting sure people who yeah who have that work uh, ethic yeah i mean it's hard not to just you know it's hard not to respect somebody that has you know that 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 style of work ethic re- exactly. regardless if you know you you, dif- you have differences in you know philosophical bearings exactly. but i mean it, it is and it, and it seems like in vermont they came head to head with the, the cooperation versus i guess the you know american individualism which was you know very strong there and uh, and i'm sure you know here as well and, yeah i think it was similar experience here right as well right yep. right um 
and so you know getting getting back to the the gardening piece uh, you know you said you have your own gardens mm-hmm. uh, what else what other sorts of advice you've talked about the composting i guess the soil right you know that's number one two and three <laughs> But exactly. what, what, what else What else is there in terms of watering, in terms of rotating crops? Uh, well, I, I think the, the biggest thing is, um, you know, as you compost it, I mentioned that, you know, they try to get the soil to be as good at the beginning and the end. And one thing I remember very much about Scott was that uh, as soon as he harvested, let's say, radishes in the, uh, in the late spring, he would add compost, and then he would plant uh, lettuce. Um, he, he constantly used the garden. The garden was never, there was never an empty place wow. in the garden. And he constantly was planting and, uh, and fertilizing. So that, that was a big influence yeah. on me, yeah. that uh, he just kept that garden going all as light as it could. Right. And their their work schedule. I mean, they worked hard, but it was basically four hours a day of what they call bread labor, exactly. And then four hours a day of you know, as you described, you know, community activities, letter writing, uh, reading. Mm-hmm. Uh, how were they able to accomplish so much working four hours a day? What six six days a week? Right. Well, they accomplished a lot because they were very organized. You know, right. they they would set out a plan of what they would do that day, that month that year sure and so i think the the discipline which they approach things so for instance if we look around this beautiful stone house you can imagine the discipline it took just to gather the amount of stones you need to build this house which they did over years yeah and they made piles of stone getting ready for the time when they were going to build the house and so that's a good example of how disciplined they were in terms of their work scene yeah. You know, they planned everything out meticulously and then uh, follow through on that. Right, right. And maybe we could talk a little bit about the stone house that we're in now and how, mm-hmm. how they did that. Yeah, they, um, it was mostly, they had a stone house in Vermont that Helen loved. And so uh, after they had lived in the old farmhouse next door here, uh, she decided that she would have liked uh, would like to live in a stone house again. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was mostly her idea to the point where Scott called it Helen's house, even, <laughs> okay. even though he worked on it yeah. with her. And so uh, she went ahead and planned it. It looks very similar to the place in Vermont. Okay, you know, kind of a Swiss Alpine uh, influence with uh, balconies and uh, beautiful views yeah. and big windows. Um, so they took they took a um, a method uh, called the flag method of uh, stone um, forms, okay, and uh, basically you start in you get one corner of the the building flush and and square, and then you start in one corner and you work your way around with these forms. And they modified the forms because they were elders at the time Mm -hmm. so that Helen didn't have to lift the stones. So their forms are only about two feet high, okay? And they'd start in a corner, get that secure, and then work around. And then by the time they got to the next corner, that first corner was already dry and ready, so they would take the form off and put it on the second corner. So they had to have a bunch of forms, but they didn't need to have forms for the entire building because they moved the forms gotcha. around as okay. they built. And that also allowed um, that they never had a big wall to worry about. If you notice, you know, uh, cement buildings, they usually build one wall and then they have to secure it while they build the others. But since they went around the building uh, slowly and then um, also the windows and the doors were built into the uh, into the forms, that uh, it was a very secure way to do it. And they could just do it at their own pace. Right. Um, And then once they got to a certain height, they would build scaffolding. Again, it didn't have to be that high. And uh, the rocks and stones weren't that big so that they were easily handed up to Helen and Scott would mix the cement in in buckets and hand up the buckets and uh, Helen would do that. So they had a, a pile of stones that were flat that were for the out outer side then they had a pile of stones that were flat on two sides for the corners and then they had what they called the ugly stones which was what they used in the middle uh they would just pour cement and uh, just put the stones in the middle because they didn't have to be uh you know one or two-sided uh flat um 
And then they also, you know, obviously put metal and things like that in the, in the forms. But if you look at, if you look at the walls, you can see how plumb and square they are. Uh, the house is about 50 years old now, and it's really not showing the the stonework is not showing. No, I mean you look from the outside, yeah, it could have been built. Yeah, it could have been built last year. Exactly. Right some of the uh, the balconies are starting to show some wear and tear after 50 years in the main yeah, uh, I mean, winters and summers water, and things like that, yeah. and the salt water. And we're planning uh, to replace the balconies uh, over the next few years. Okay. Uh, but the house itself is really solid, and and so are the outbuildings. They're in great shape. Yeah. And uh, what are some of the benefits of building with stone? Well, the benefit is the longevity. Um, and she liked the aesthetics of stone. I mean, that's what she said. She just yeah. loved uh, that they were so hardy and strong and looked so beautiful. Yeah. Um, I think for uh, the common person who wants to put up a house quickly right. and get in there, I don't think it makes <laughs> yeah. a lot of sense. Right, right. Uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense in terms of heat. The R factor of a stone is pretty low. Right. Uh, they did have some insulation in the walls, but basically it's a, it's a pretty difficult house to heat. It is, um, okay. Um, but I think it's the longevity that they loved about stone. Right, right. And you don't have to paint it. <laughs> yep, and it's, it's it a free rot. material. I mean, it is, yeah, it is. Yeah. in that way, but the, yeah. the amount of work is unbelievable. Yeah, yeah, I mean, to put it together, right. But once you have it, you're, you're good to go. Exactly. And, uh, um, and so how, how did their philosophies or lifestyle change throughout the years? I mean, they, they were 20 years in Vermont and I don't know, or in 40 plus years here, here in Maine, how, how did things change as, um, they grew, uh, let's say more wise, but also, you know, more older and frail and, you know, more difficult. Well, I, to... I don't think it changed much. Wow. I mean, I think they really stuck to what they did right. and what they did well. Obviously they did it at a slower pace and I think, um, as Scott got older, uh, you know, Helen would hire people like my wife, Nancy, to work with him okay. in the garden and yeah. cutting wood. Uh, he loved cutting wood, plus they needed a lot of wood right. uh, to heat the house. So they, they did hire people towards the end. I think that would be the major um, accommodation. Sure. But basically, they, uh, they pretty much uh, did the work themselves. The house, uh, the new house here, the stone house, they did the stonework with some volunteer help and some paid help, but okay. the carpentry, uh, he was very skilled, oh, wow. but he wasn't about, you know, he was in his 90s, sure. you know, getting on ladders and right. lifting heavy things was yeah. beyond him at that point. So yeah. uh, somebody that they gave a piece of land to down the road, uh, Brett um, Brubaker, was the builder. Wow. And so that he did all the, all the woodworking and the cabinet work. And, and they really, I mean, maybe we can talk about just their bartering. I mean, not only bartering, they just gave things away. I mean, we talked about the land in Stratton, but they talked about how um, when they were in Vermont, they would just go to town and give stuff away. And there was one woman, they said, from New York City who was could not comprehend <laughs> that they were just given fresh you know, produce. Right. I think uh, one thing, they were very generous, very generous with their time. Yeah. When people came to visit... They wouldn't stop what they're doing, but they would. Uh, if you did it with them, they would share their knowledge right. and and their information with people. And they never turned anybody away. People would write all the time, or they would people would show up all the time, wow. and they always greeted them and uh, entertained them and uh, entertained their questions. Um, sure. And of, often offered them a meal. Often offered them a place to stay, you know, to camp out on their on their land. So that was. I was always impressed with their generosity because right. it couldn't have been easy uh, to have all these strangers sure. and probably 99% of them ask the same questions <laughs> as the other people. Right, right. And uh, so they were really, I have to say, very generous with their time. And when they uh, sold their land here in Maine, I know that the people who bought the land, they sold it for what they bought it. For, right, you wow. know, and which was very inexpensive. Yeah. So the people, the homesteads along here, all the way to Four Season Farm, really got off to a, a good start because they didn't have to spend a lot of money on right. their land. Yeah. Um, so that also was very generous. Yeah. And then uh, you know they did speaking engagements and things like that uh, that also spoke to their generosity of spirit. I mean, it really was amazing, and and, and it's um, you, you wonder if it could be done today, and you know, what is your advice for people wanting to live that sort of lifestyle? Well, I think 
it's a really good lifestyle. I think it's, it really makes a lot of sense. Again, people have to figure out their own version of yeah. the good life. But right. I think the principles that they espouse in in their books and in their lectures uh, are really important ones. And, uh, you know, I certainly found them to be important to me in raising a family and living off the land like I did for a long time. Okay. Um, so I think it's very pertinent, if not more important, more important today with climate change and everything sure. on how we yeah. live in connection with nature, in harmony with nature. They yeah. they really, uh, that was important to them, and they saw that as as essential for themselves and for the human race to right. survive. Yeah. And, um, and then Scott's, I think, political views in terms of, you know, economics and how an economy should run. Uh, is also very pertinent today, kind of a democratic socialist view sure. of of the world and our okay. economy. And if you look at kind of what's happening in our country today, a lot of the things that um, Scott said back in the early 1900s, uh, if we had done those, <laughs> we'd be right. better off. Right. Or there's certainly uh, issues that he talked about that are still around today. Definitely. I mean, yeah. it's it's amazing, you know, the, the kind of foresight that he had a uh, hundred years ago. And, you know, yes, these are was, problems that are persisting uh, today. He was very prescient in terms of his political analysis. Yeah. You know, income inequality leading to the decline of democracy was a big issue for him. Okay. You know, how we look at freedom and um, independence of the individual versus, uh, you know, the social good. Um, really, really great writing. And very, very important, I think, today. Yeah, and still issues that we're grappling with now. Exactly, and, uh, totally. But I, I, it, it does come <clears throat> come head to head again with the you know the the individualism streak that we have in you know Western culture as opposed exactly. to the more you know cooperative uh, mindset uh, mm-hmm. in Eastern cultures. And it's, exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, and you know one thing that struck me is just the how cheap land was back then. And, yes, and exactly. They talked about they bought land for $3 an acre, and back then a good axe was $4.50. And so I looked up, I, my, my, my axe that I bought was $65. <laughs> and so that would be the equivalent today of buying land for $42 an acre. Gotcha. And I looked up, I'm like, where can you buy, where's the cheapest land in the United States? And I looked, it was in New Mexico. And, Interesting. And, you know, clearly someplace yeah, yeah. probably in desert New Mexico <laughs> that's only good for growing cactus. So exactly. I, I, what, what do you do today? Yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's a huge problem. Yeah. I think uh, young people, and we've had young people come and uh, be resident stewards here. And, uh, you know, those people who went off looking for uh, a homesteading experience or farming experience really uh, really struggled in terms of finding places yeah. because real estate prices are so high. Crazy. And now the cost of living itself is high. I mean, I have yeah. two uh, two children in their 30s, and now he just turned, my son just turned 40. Uh, the cost of living is huge. Yeah. And so, um, you know, setting up a homestead uh, without having uh, full-time jobs off the farm is right. really difficult. Yeah. Uh, farming, uh, although there are a lot of, there's a lot of help uh, in terms of setting up farms. Um, as I mentioned, uh, MAFCA, the Maine Organic Gardening Farmers Association, uh, has a lot of apprenticeship programs to help people. Um, Maine Farmland Trust uh, also is, assists people in finding land, matching you know f- uh, farmland with potential oh, wow. farmers. So there is a lot of ha- uh, a lot of help. There's a lot of subsidy for greenhouses and en- energy efficient um, uh, accommodations on, on a homestead or a, or a farm. So there is a lot of help, but I think the initial uh, Purchase of land is not easy anymore. Yeah, it's the hardest part. And yeah. um, I think we had it a lot easier back in the 70s when I moved to Maine. Right. Um, but again, the salaries were really low uh, then, too. So Sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's, never, it's never easy. <laughs> you no, want to be, it no, is not but easy. It is, but it is, I think it's a challenge for young people who want to yeah, farm or want to so. homestead. Yeah. 
uh, just to get that piece of land. Right, right. I mean, I'm just thinking of how it would be today as Helen and Scott Nearing. I don't know, would they have an Instagram account and, you <laughs> know, and all the all the posts of, you know, here we are uh, yeah. composting? Uh, yeah. I don't think they would have done Instagram or Facebook, <laughs> but I think she might have liked email because she was a tremendous communicator. Oh, wow, okay. Uh, she wrote yeah. many, many letters. Anybody who wrote, wrote a letter or a postcard to her, uh, she wrote back. She had a Rolodex that was, you know, unbelievable. Wow. Um, but I think she would have liked email, but I yeah. don't know. <laughs> and h- how was it? Uh, Helen lived twenty years longer than Scott. He was he was considerably uh, older than her when they yeah. got when they met. He died in nineteen eighty three, and she died in nineteen ninety five. Okay, so twelve years by. And, and so, how was she able to maintain the the farm on her own? I, you had said there had been a lot of volunteer help, and yeah, others. well, it was difficult when yeah. Scott died. Uh, she was surprised uh, that people kept coming to visit. She thought they were coming to see only Scott. Oh. And, uh, and uh, we realized, and she realized, that she was a big part of the show yeah. as well. Yeah. And people kept on coming. So she needed help, and yeah. she knew that. And uh, my wife, Nancy, was a big help to her. And then she had another woman named Ellen, who was a very big confidant of hers, um, that worked side by side with her for years. Okay. So she did get help. Uh, that she needed in her, in her elder years, right. but she lived here for twelve years. But she also uh, was smart enough to leave in the winter. Oh, okay. And yeah. she had a little uh, trailer on some uh, on this little organic homestead in Palm Beach, Florida. Nice. And uh, she would go down there and write, okay. uh, and for several months, and um, and then uh, people would come and uh, house it. Uh, Wow. This place. So she was smart enough to get out. In yeah, the it's uh, it's <laughs> harsh for a ninety something year old. Exactly. These are harsh winters. <laughs> yeah, I so, mean it's. Yeah. Uh, she struggled without Scott, but because uh, yeah. it was a really a beautiful love story yeah, between the I two mean, of them. It really was. Um, but uh, she she did pretty well. And so, what was what was their relationship like? Were, were, was there one person in the relationship that would handle finances, for instance, and another? You know, it's often a symbiotic, uh, you know, complementary relationship where you know one person is good at one thing and the other, you know, they right. they kind of, it's this meld. Well, I think Scott was known for his intellect, certainly, but yeah. also Helen was ex- extremely bright and yeah. uh, extremely articulate. Uh, but I think uh, the where they, when they grew up, it was very uh, much a patriarchal situation. Sure. And so she let Scott lead the way in so many things mm-hmm. uh, until, you know, his health started to fail and he started to slow down. Um, so I think there was a separation of, uh, of, of jobs. Uh, she considered herself a housewife. She did all the cooking okay. and, uh, but she works. She loved being outside. She hated being a housewife. She hated cooking. Uh, she really wanted to be outside working. Yeah. So she would do uh, a really fast job on those uh, okay. things in terms of cooking. Right. It was very ironic that she published a cookbook because <laughs> she really did not like to cook. And uh, so she really did work side by side with Scott. They were yeah. really a great team yeah. together. And. Uh, she, I think she would probably, if she was being interviewed, would say there was a lot of separation. Uh, but in reality, I don't think there was. Yeah. Yeah, wow. they really did a lot together. So talk about, you mentioned the caretakers. Uh, how, yeah. does, how does that work? Yeah, well, uh, when Helen died in 1995, uh, she was in the process of uh, developing a nonprofit through uh, the Trust for Public Land. It's an organization out of Boston, a national organization. Um, She died in a car accident right when she was finalizing everything. Oh, wow. And so it was left to a group of her friends, myself, my wife, other people in in her immediate uh, community to kind of put together uh, the Good Life Center. Okay. And uh, her ideas towards the end... Uh, again, I mentioned that when Scott died, people kept coming. She realized that when she died, people were going to keep coming. Yeah. So it was her desire to keep the library here. It was her desire to keep the house open to the public uh, and so that their, uh, their ideas would continue to inspire uh, future generations. And that was really a strong part of her legacy. Uh, so we formed the Good Life Center. It's a nonprofit uh, it has a small board, 
And the idea was that people would come on an annual basis, live in the house, um, do the garden, greet visitors. Mm -hmm. um, and that we did that for many, many years um, with people living in the house. Everybody had their kind of idea of uh, how to live. Sure. And so over time, when people came to visit and see how Helen and Scott lived, they really were seeing how the caretaker lived. The caretaker lived. Um, and so the breaking point came when there was a lot of um, uh, issues in the house, some mildew issues in the house. Uh, people hadn't really taken care of the house properly. Uh, they had a composting toilet system, which wasn't uh, used properly. Um, There's a lot of issues in the house. And at the same time, there happened to be uh, some issues with the board as well. Uh, it was kind of a starting to become dysfunctional okay. group of people. And so uh, myself and another woman came along and uh, kind of righted the ship um, in terms of... Uh, the board, and uh, we looked at the house. We closed the house, actually, for a year okay. so we could clean it up. The basement was a mess. Uh, the mildew was starting to uh, become an issue. With uh, The library was threatened. Um, so when we cleaned it up, uh, the board at that time decided that it was a good idea that the people who came and lived here wouldn't live in the house. I see. They would, and we developed an apartment in one of the outbuildings for oh, them. Wow. Okay. And then they would uh, they would use the house lightly. They would still continue to use the kitchen and the bathroom, but on a limited basis. And that way, the house uh, was maintained, and also people who came to visit could during the season could see the house and see how Helen and Scott lived. Right. And uh, so it was. Uh, you know, the tension between being a museum, a living museum, and a place for people to live. Right. Uh, we tried to figure that out. Yeah, it's a, definitely a tough puzzle to solve. Yeah, and we're still trying to figure it out, <laughs> what, what the best, uh, you know, the best way to do it. But uh, for the last 15 years, uh, we've had a couple come live in the apartment and take care of the visitors, and it seems to be working very well. And so that's like yeah. a year-long stint? Uh, no, we, we also changed it from instead of a year to seasonal Okay, uh, from May until... Uh, uh, middle of October. Okay. Yeah. And so, and is the place basically empty during the winter months? Yeah. Yeah. We okay. close it up, train the pipes. Right. And, uh, that seems to be working. Okay. Yeah. Makes sense. And, yeah. You know, a, lot, a lot less issues where you don't have to worry about exactly. water damage and <laughs> pipes bursting. Exactly. So may, maybe we could talk just a little bit about the property and the, the buildings and the gardens and sure. there's a fairy trail and geodesic yep. dome and mm -hmm. all that. Right. Uh, well, it's not a geodesic dome. It's yurts. And, Sorry, uh, right. That's okay. <laughs> uh, a good friend of theirs named Bill Copperthwaite uh, was what they call the yurt man. He went okay. uh, all over the world. He was a Harvard-educated person who um, lived off in the middle of the woods in, uh, in down east Maine, and uh, he built... He loved yurts, and he uh, conveyed that love of yurts all over the world. He would go to nonprofits and schools and things like that, and do yurt workshops. People, he would design the yurt, and people would gather their uh, volunteers together and build the yurts. Mm -hmm. And um, he also was very much into indigenous uh, people's culture, so he gathered a lot of uh, hand tools and things like that. He was he was very skilled uh, uh, builder. And so uh, when uh, after Scott died, Helen really wanted a place for people to come and stay. He she didn't want them staying in the house with her. So he and myself and a couple other people uh, built uh, some wooden yurts on the property. And uh, we use those for people to stay in. And now we use them for, um, you know, group meetings and things okay. like that. We have college uh, groups come. We have Outward Bound that come. Oh, wow. Uh, and uh, some environmental camps, uh, high school groups, elementary school groups. So we use the yurt for uh, wow. a variety of of reasons, uh, but it's 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 made out of wood. It was built completely with hand tools, wow. and um, unfortunately, Bill died um, a while ago. But his legacy was really strong in terms of uh, yurts and uh, just uh, caring for people through those 
community efforts of building yeah. yurts together. All right. Yeah, it's really, really fun. And the Ferry Trail is a, a small hiking trail for kids that we developed here. And uh, Helen very much lo- uh, believed in fairies. <laughs> okay. Uh, she, she had a very interesting uh, belief system about fairies. And uh, so we... We call it uh, the fairy trail in honor of her, and they, you could probably find some fairy homes up there. All right, yes, enough. yes, indeed. I, yeah. Last time I visited, I took my kids, as I was saying. Exactly, there, and, and there's were, a nice little meditation yurt yeah. on the fairy trail as well. Yeah. And is there a greenhouse on the property? Yeah, the greenhouse is attached to the garden, okay. just like at the, uh, the old house here. Uh, it's a different design. They learned a lot of lessons from the, uh, the original uh, uh, the original greenhouse in terms of slope of the roof and things like that. But it's an unheated greenhouse uh, made with very uh, simple uh, products, you know, single pane glass. There's really nothing fancy about it, but it works really well. There's a stone wall in on the north side, so that absorbs some heat and lets sure. off some heat at night, so that extend, extends the season a bit uh, in terms of heating it. But we used it for our hot weather crops like tomato, uh, eggplants, peppers, things like the basil that really flourish with a little extra heat uh, in this main climate. And uh, so, yeah, and so they, they had a, a really nice book called The Sun-Heated Greenhouse. Okay. And again, they, uh, they experimented with growing vegetables uh, four seasons, and uh, they were very successful with it. Wow. All right. And um, this is this is the main house. You mentioned the, the caretaker's house has been retrofitted and that was a storage. Yeah, barn. it was a storage. Uh, it was they built the barn first. First, they, there's a stone outhouse, which they built because okay. uh, they hadn't built out of stone for a while. And then they had they built the uh, what we call the barn, which is this outbuilding here. Okay. And in the north end of the barn was a storage uh, area that we converted into an apartment. Okay. For the uh, the caretakers or resident stewards, and um, yeah, it's quite comfortable. Uh, it's rustic. People know when they come here, they're living in a rustic. It's a very simple living right. situation, so that they learn about simple living. Yeah, and uh, and then they use the house, and we we look at the property as a demonstration homestead. Okay. So we have the garden that uh, is a, is a organic garden. We have uh, composting heaps built just like Scott did. Right. We have solar panels that run the house. We have a composting toilet system in the house. Wow. Um, that was one of the original Clivus Multrum to- toilets in the state. And we take the compost out of that and put it on, on our apple trees. Okay. So when you add that all together, it's kind of a demonstration right. homestead right. for people to come and see how things work. Now, is the is the farm connected to the grid? Uh, it is. It is. Uh, we do get a lot of our electricity from the um, from the solar panels, right. but not all of it. Yeah. And then in the winter, when we're not here, we we generate a credit. Oh wow! Um, for That's the because we don't use a lot of right, electricity right. when we're not here. Now, and did the Nearings have electricity I, in Vermont? I, in Vermont, they did not. Yeah. When they moved to Maine, they did. The old farmhouse did have okay. running water and right. electricity. So. When you read Living the Good Life, that's about Vermont. Yeah. And so they didn't have running water or electricity there. Wow. Oh, so they stepped up. They were living in luxury. Here. Exactly. <laughs> and then when they moved speaking. Here, and then they were in their 70s and 90s when they moved here. So they were, you know, they had a bathroom and, right. uh, yeah. and running water here. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, um, how can people uh, find out more about the Nearings, more about the, the Good Life Center? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, we do have a website, www.goodlife.org, and uh, there's information about visiting. Uh, part of their legacy uh, in terms of community uh, affairs was that they invited the community into their house on Sunday nights for music and on Monday nights for discussion groups. Oh, and they would discuss all kinds of things from what was happening in the world to, uh, you know, what was happening in the garden. And uh, Scott would also would often fall asleep, but he'd wake up and give some pearls of wisdom to the group. And um, it was really a, a great legacy. And so uh, from that, we um, we started a speaker series 
Great. So uh, now it's on Sundays. It used to be Monday nights like the Nearings did. But in the, uh, after the pandemic, we decided to uh, make it in the afternoon um, so we could do it outside if we could. Uh, so on Sunday afternoons during the summer, we have speakers, and they come and they volunteer to talk about um, a wide range of things related to uh, either their political legacy or their homesteading legacy. Okay. Um, so... Um, for instance, so far this in July, we've had, we had uh, a director of a uh, of an environmental group come and talk about climate change in the okay. coast of Maine, and then the next we had a history teacher come and talk about uh, the elections and uh, okay. things like that. We're uh, upcoming. We have an environmental author. Uh, we have uh, a Wabanaki uh, professor from UMO is going to talk about indigenous uh, people's issues. We have a local politician to come about local issues. We right. have um, an African American uh, professor from Colby College coming to talk about kind of the hidden history of uh, black uh, citizens in the state of Maine. Okay. Uh, we've had a whole wide range of uh, people come. And then we also have people come and talk about the nearing legacy, either their buildings or their. Uh, gardening and uh, philosophies, things like that. So it's a wide range. Yeah. But we try to hit on a lot of different aspects of their legacy. And if people who are just trying to, you know, sink their teeth into what, where, where, where would you get started? I mean, I read Living the Good Life, right. or their, uh, and I haven't read their other books. Are there, what, what's your favorite? What do you recommend? Well, I think starting with Living the Good Life, uh, we combine Living the Good Life with Continuing the Good Life, and that book is available as The Good Life. Okay. And uh, that's a great place to start. It really, I think it's an amazing book in that it, it gives you the philosophy of their, uh, their lifestyle, but also it's like a hands-on book. It tells you how to make compost heaps and how to right. plant, and and uh, so it's the it's the why and uh, also the how yeah. uh, to their lifestyle. So that's a great place. And then uh, they have <clears throat> again books on um, maple maple sugar uh, is one of their more famous books from uh, their Vermont years. Okay. Uh, a lot of people still continue to buy that book. And then Making of a Radical and Conscious of a Radical, which is about Scott's development as a, uh, as a political radical. And then uh, Loving and Leaving the Good Life is about Scott and Helen's. Well, it's a Helen's kind of tribute to Scott over the last year of his life and yeah. how he died and yeah. uh, lived such an exemplary life. And um, so that's kind of uh, her, her story uh, on Scott's last year of his life. So there's a lot of really, um, you know, beautiful things that they put down on paper. Yeah, it really. That is, is, and they're all available on our website. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, it's yeah. uh, it's really quite a legacy, and it it's is. great to see that it's continuing uh, even 30 years after Helen's passing. So. Yes, it is, and uh, we're always amazed uh, how inspirational the place is. And as long as people are going to continue to come, our small little nonprofit uh, is going to try to keep keep going excellent all right well warren it's been uh, it's been a pleasure well thank you Mike. all right thank you all right we did it <laughs> <laughs>